Hello and welcome to this screencast on uh, using MorphoJ to do geometric morphometric analysis. Um, this is just a general overview of how to use Chris Klingenberg's uh, MorphoJ software package. MorphoJ is uh, implemented in Java, which means it can work across platforms, so it'll work on Windows, Macs, uh, and Linux as well, um, which is quite uh, useful and friendly. Um, and it can be installed pretty easily if you just Google uh, MorphoJ. Uh, it will almost certainly take you right. In fact, let's try it. Create a new window. Almost certainly will take you right to uh, the the lab home, like that. So you go there, and you're actually able to download it. So it has instructions down here. In general, use the standard installer, um, but please do take a look. That I think believes includes the. Um, is self-contained, so includes the um, Java uh, runtime environment, which you need. Your computer probably already has one, um, but um, just in case you can use that. Um, and also note here, and this is available on um, Desire to Learn for our class website, but the online user's guide to MorphoJ is also available here, which will w is incredibly useful and actually has lots of great advice, uh, not just on using the software, but actually on um, on morphometric analysis in general, including links to many useful papers. Uh, the uh, reference for MorphoJ is also down here from Molecular Ecology Resources from a number of years ago. So you can go ahead and download it if you haven't already, although uh, if you're taking uh, evolutionary developmental biology with me, you've already downloaded it and done this. So let's assume you've already downloaded and installed, and that works. Um, if you uh, open MorphoJ, however you do it, for me I'll just use Spotlight. I've already got it open, but I would just use Spotlight and go MorphoJ.app. Um, for Windows, it'd be just an executable. Uh, you'll open it up and it'll look something like this when you first see it. And when you start it, you're not going to have any projects. You'll see mine if I open it. I've got a whole set of recent projects um, that I've done. I've used these are actually all very old projects of mine. But uh, for the moment, let's start uh, with a brand new project. Um, and for this project, we're actually going to use um, some data set actually from Chris Klingenberg's lab um, that's from this paper uh, at the top called Evolution of Sexual Dimorphism of Wing Shape in the Drosophila Melanogaster Subgroup. Um, we'll go through it in a little bit for the moment. Just uh, know that this is uh, 15 landmark data, two-dimensional data from uh, Drosophila species uh, for their wings. Uh, and it will turn out to be a nice data set for us to test several questions uh, that are of interest in evolutionary developmental biology. Um, and we're actually downloading this data available is available on a public uh, data repository called Dryad. Um, or if you're taking my class, uh, it's actually available on uh, Desire to Learn um, in our tutorial section. Um, but you'll see here a couple of important files, the landmark coordinates of fly wings. And if you open that up, It'll be just a series of numbers here where we have species spe species and sex identifier first. We'll come back to this. And the rest of the data here are just landmarks that we will be using. Uh, and there's also, and we'll come back to this in a further tu tutorial, but there's also uh, a phylo phylogeny uh, data in here as well that we'll be able to use down the road. Okay, so back to MorphoJ. Uh, you go here. We'll assume you've downloaded it and you've got uh, a folder with the data in it. What you're first going to do is you're going to create a new project. You can name it what you want. I'll just call this for the moment Drosophila Wing 15 Landmark. And the reason I'm not calling this necessarily by uh, the specific uh, data set is because uh, there are other data sets that are also 15 landmarks for Drosophila that we could potentially also implement uh, and, and integrate into this at a later date. We probably won't. Uh, in general, I, I keep projects quite separate, but that would be potential. Um, name for the new data set, we can call this Drosophila species, and we'll call it sexual dimorphism. So sexual dimorphism meaning how, this, how the males and females differ for size and shape. You'll notice I'm using camel case, where the first letter of each word here is in uppercase. Um, so the dimensionality of this data, this is just two-dimensional data, so we don't need it. We keep that as two-dimensional. Uh, we're not looking at any form of object symmetry, which we have not yet discussed in the class, so you can leave that no. The file type here is just text, 
And here we just have to go to the appropriate file. So for me, I have to go to teaching and lectures, to my class, and I grab it. And this is the Drosso raw nine species text that you should have downloaded. Click correct. It'll immediately go to reports. This is a useful window. It just tells you reading from text file, 866 line from the data file, finish reading. You're so far not gonna have any graphic or results. So we go back to this uh, Drosophila sexual dimorphism, we can click on it. And we wanna start even uh, essentially before we, we do anything else to make sure that there's no observations which uh, maybe are outliers. Often you will find very extreme outliers when accidentally people have switched landmarks. Um, so what you go, do here is you go to find outliers. And what this represents is it shows the position of the 15 landmarks that we're using. Uh, it's a very simple graphical rep, uh, interface here. Uh, and over here in this cumulative frequency, uh, blue is the theoretical distribution of observations, while red is the observed. And they should, if there's no outliers, they should line up pretty well, more or less like they do here. However, one of the most useful functions of this is to click on the actual individual observations, and you can see that uh, where the displacement of particular landmarks here. So in this case, landmark six and two, it almost looks like landmark six is over landmark two. So potentially that would suggest maybe a switching of the landmark. However, the reason I don't think it's the case here is for two reasons. One, if that was the case, you'd expect two and six to be switched. So there should, in addition to be a red line going from six to two, there should be one going from two to six or something similar to that. We only see it unidirectionally. In addition, as we go down here and look at other ones, um, we'll notice that another individual of that same species, Maur, which is from Marishiana, has that similar displacement. So that actually may just be um, a function of, of that species, although it's clearly not for all of them, but for some of them. Um, this number here, besides the uh, identifier for that individual specimen, represents sort of the magnitude of, of, of the um, degree, essentially, degree of how far out it might be as an outlier. Um, but in these cases, nothing looks extreme, so it doesn't look like there's any outliers. If we did have any, we can actually uh, click on that and, and swap landmarks, and you can say which landmarks you think may be needed to be uh, swap swapped, although in this case, none needed to. So here we can press cancel because we haven't made any changes, otherwise we'd press uh, accept. If there was an observation that looked really messed up, and you wanted to exclude it, you could just Go click on that and go exclude like that, and that would remove it. However, in this case, we'll, we'll keep them all in, so we don't actually have to do anything. All right, so we go back to our project tree, and the first thing that we would generally do for this is do the Procresti superimposition, but we're actually going to do uh, a step before that. What we're actually going to do is extract some information from the identifier string in the data. So we click this, and you'll notice it has the identifier string. So this was the first column uh, in the data sheet. And that's by default considered the identifier string for this piece of software. And it turns out that the first five characters, so in this case E-R-E-C-T, -E and you can go down to other ones, M-E-L-A-N, they represent the names of the species. So we're going to create a, identif a new classifier called species. That's our name. Our first character is number one because it represents the first um, character in this string. And the last character is five, because we it's always five elements, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so we do that. Now that's gonna depend on what different people have done in this case, because the person who generated this data is also one of the developers of the software, it behaves quite nicely. So we click execute. We're actually gonna go back, extract new classifiers, do it again. Now we see that species one, we're gonna create a new one here. We're gonna call it sex. Sex is actually just the six character, so E-R-E-C-T, and then F, the capital F, represents females and males. So that's going to be just the six character. So we do that, execute that one more time. And we can do it one more time, just for the cl classifier. It's actually not one we need to use. We'll just call it individual, and that's going to be uh, characters seven through eight, these last two characters here in, in, in this string. And we execute that again. So now if we look at our classifiers, edit classifiers, we see we've got our species, sex, and individual. It's always very useful to look them and make sure everything makes sense and that it's sorted them properly and that's going to depend on uh, um, proper namings and stuff like that. And this has some easy uh, button pushing GUI based approaches if you need to make any changes.
Okay, for this we don't need to change any. And uh, we've now got our data essentially in a format which we can do analysis. And so we will complete uh, this tutorial for now. And, uh,